two curves which form an angle at z0 are mapped upon curves forming the same angle, in sense as well as in size. In view of this property, the mapping by w equals f of z is said to be conformal at all points with f prime of z not being equal to zero. En d'autres termes, si deux arcs différenciables gamma 1 et gamma 2 du plan z in other words, if two differentiable paths, gamma 1 and gamma 2, of the z plane have initial point z0, the images of these, these paths under the consideration w equals f of z are differentiable paths with the initial point w0, and the demitangents of point w0 font an angle oriente égal à l'angle oriente des demitangents of the half tangents at w0 make the same oriented angle as the half tangents to the paths gamma 1 and gamma 2 at the point z0. For this reason, we say that a holomorphic transformation of W equal to f de z is conform on chaque point z0, where the derivative f prime de z0 is not equal to 0. Salut tout le monde. Welcome back to another differential geometry reading stream. I'm Anthony, obviously. And this is episode 25 now. So we are currently in chapter 6 on mappings, section 62, conformal mapping of surfaces into a plane on page 195 of Differential Geometry by Erwin Kreisig, Dover edition. So at the beginning of last episode, I did a rant about conformal mappings in general kind of really related to mostly complex analysis though because then we're looking at that concept in obviously differential geometry right but first i'm going to address the viewer comment of the week rather viewer comments of the week and we're returning to none other than the legendary og vanderhagen the stampede who has been commenting from the beginning then I had the few months off. Now we're back. Vanderhagen the Stampede is back at it again with more comments. So shout out to you, Vanderhagen the Stampede, for sticking in there this whole time. And <clears throat> there were some interesting things that, that were brought up in Vanderhagen the Stampede's previous comments. One actually was that I'm just going to call them Vanderhagen because it's a mouthful and you know, this is not like a, you know, a minus by any means, but, you know, when people don't use their real names online or like real profile pictures, I'm like, how do I refer to this person, right? But anyways, so Vanderhagen commented before that they speak uh, a bit of Portuguese and a little, you know, a little bit of that Brazilian going on, which I think is funny from my perspective because... I trained Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, right? And so if you look at the origin of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is there's elements of like, you know, Japanese Judo in it. So if I'm perfectly honest, I've learned more Japanese terms training BJJ ironically than I have learned any Portuguese. And that like any of the like Brazilian lingo or whatever is just like the secondary culture of like the practitioners of jujitsu rather than like actual moves and stuff, which I think is funny. But because uh, like maybe you would assume that if you're going to train Brazilian jujitsu, you're going to learn Portuguese. Not necessarily the case, although there are some people like there's this one guy, right? Like Mikey Musamichi, who is, you know, basically the the epitome of jujitsu nerd this guy taught himself portuguese using google translate sheerly for the love of jujitsu i would say he is an outlier in all this vanderhagen mentioned that uh, they speak portuguese or know a little bit of that so i thought that was interesting also another past comment from vanderhagen me stampede yes the the book behind me that is the dragon copy of the compiler's book it's just like the international edition but it's the dragon compiler's book and uh basically the long and the short of it was is like i'm in uh uva i'm in this experimental 
biology, cancer, wet lab, and then COVID hits. And I'm thinking to myself, like, I'm just being real with myself. I'm like, you know, programming, software engineering, computer science, that's the way out. Not necessarily, necessarily doing, you know, wet lab experiments day in, day out, which is okay. <clears throat> but I was like, how am I going to have the expertise or knowledge or something to then like break into that new area relatively new or like take my what would you would say is like hobbyist programming level experience or like very niche scientific programming coming from like you know a scientific academic background how do i take that and then go for like industry standard like software engineering computer science so i was like I'm going to come up with a project for myself at all layers of the stack, right? So I have like, you know, maybe I'm going to make an 8-bit computer on breadboards or maybe I'm going to do like a 6502 microprocessor build and we're going to play around in assembly more or you know, I built the Raspberry Pi cluster or you know, with the compilers, I was thinking maybe I'm going to write my own compiler maybe i'm going to write my own operating system from the ground up there's that whole like nand to tetris project right and then one of you know you're in the compiler layer they just kind of like give you their own pre-made simplified one so it's like why not in that project have the sub project of the compiler right so i kicked off all those things and then it basically converged down to like what did I really spend my time on was like programming this like basically like a program about Rubik's cubes but it's very math involved it heavily relies on like the abstract algebra aspects of these things but then implementing to get answers to the, like the abstract algebra you could say of Rubik's cubes using the CPU cluster approach that's what I really spent my time on rather than, you know, making a compiler from scratch or, you know, making like a 6502 microprocessor build that could like, I don't know, do like Fibonacci sequence or something like that. I'd be like, this is what it would have been like if I would have had a Commodore or an Apple II. But compilers are also interesting, I think, because people throughout uh, time will compare consciousness and minds to whatever is like the state of the art technology at the time. And nowadays, that is especially true with computers. People are like, oh, you know, your brain is like a computer. And, you know, we have not, you know, even with the whole chat GPT thing, like we haven't really made a machine that replicates a human brain and surely you know computers were inspired by things that brains can do right so like we don't have perfect memory but then having these calculating machines with you know nearly perfect memory wow that we can take that a really long ways but with like consciousness and stuff right it's very open-ended and i don't know if you've heard of like the uh chinese room problem where you'll say, okay, well, at what point do you attribute consciousness to some machine that you've created, perhaps? And so you consider the problem of if you were inside of a box and there's some kind of a lookup table where there's input and outputs that where, uh, you know, someone puts in, in a hole in one side of the box an envelope with some Chinese on it. It's assuming you don't know Chinese because some of you watching might know Chinese. But you then go to this dictionary, this lookup table book, and you come up with the appropriate Chinese output and you put it in the outside uh, slot on the other side of this imaginary box. And it's to say, well, if you were in that process, do you really know Chinese? And then is to extend that question to say, well, what do computers know about whatever we're programming into them and whatnot, right? And so with the compiler's book, right, as I, was, as I would say to people, like, if anything, maybe the hardware of our brains 
we're not always at a point where uh, you could say the feature of consciousness would be supported, but that at some point in the past, eventually our brains did get the hardware capability to support consciousness as it were. And so consciousness is sort of like this emergent phenomena. And part of what might uh, motivate the emergence of this is living in perhaps more socially complex societies, right? Where they're, you know, you're interacting with maybe people who speak different languages, who have different cultural customs. You want to engage in trade with them. And <clears throat> maybe there are, you know, more complex moral situations that you're involved in as an individual. And when you have to recall and be held accountable for what happened in some situation that that would sort of like light up, so to speak, those latent areas of brain hardware that would then lead to like this more, you know, emergent sense of consciousness, perhaps. This is the example of 19th century England. There was this guy who was, I guess, you know, you can't really say whether or not someone in the past had a mental health diagnosis that we have now. But this guy, maybe we would say is schizophrenic, and but he lived in the 19th century England nonetheless. And they were asking him to describe what his mental experience was like. And he said it was like his brain was uh, controlled like a loom. So how textile looms were operated and you would have the different strings and it's this complex industrial machine it was like my brain is like this loom and there's someone else who's operating it right so my modern take could just be oh you know i my theory of what consciousness is like is it's like a compiler in a computer you know it's kind of like the same thing where it's like i i'm programming a computer and i have some program i put in and what i put in doesn't match up with how this computer works so it spits out errors it doesn't do what i want want me to do well it's maybe we're all we've all got our hands in everyone else's compiler throughout the day right is you know if you're interacting with someone you're like oh i got the output i wanted this is you know the, the program's working properly or if it doesn't then you're like oh well what you start digging into what's going on right funny enough Okay, I'm reading this book, The Master and His Emissary by Ian McGilchrist, right? And chapter two, so like I, I mentioned this book before, it sort of is going into the whole like hemispheric hypothesis, which I won't get into now. But chapter two, in order to explain to people what the hemispheric hypothesis is, you basically have to know about all the different functional areas of the brain. And then he's saying, okay, Given all of these functional areas of the brain, we've got the ones on the left side, we've got the ones on the right side. Look at, look at what we all now know from the last several decades, half a century of neuroscience, psychology research and stuff like that. Are all of the previous uh, stereotypes about the differences in the hemispheres holding up? Not really. Those stereotypes are breaking down. But it's a nuanced discussion, right? So he sort of is like cracking that open in chapter two of his book, right? It's like the beginning of this, right? But in doing so, he heavily relies on, or he, he references many times over the work of this guy, Michael Gazaniga, which has to do with split brain patients. So people who have epilepsy and it's so intense that, you know, the medications don't work and there isn't like an obvious area of the brain that they're going to, that they could like remove in order to treat the epilepsy. They're like, you know what, we're just going to split the corpus callosum and possibly the anterior commissure which is just, you know, these high density areas of white matter connecting the left and right brain hemispheres. And he's, it's like, well, that's to treat the epilepsy, but then we can do all these 
psychology tests, if you will now, knowing that this is an individual with a split corpus callosum. So their left and right brain hemispheres are pretty much connectively independent of each other. One thing that is true about the stereotypes of your left and right brain hemispheres is that your contralateral sides of your body are controlled by either hemisphere. That is to say, your right side of your body, the map of all of that is controlled by your left hemisphere and vice versa for the right hemisphere, having the map of all of the left side. That's not to say that there aren't like, you can almost say like redundant connections where like, anyways, those are all details we're not gonna get bogged into right now, but that goes even further with your vision. So your right hemisphere is controlling the left side of your body, the left hemisphere is controlling the right side of your body, but also your left hemisphere is handling all of the like raw visual information from your right eye and then your right brain hemisphere is getting all of the raw visual information from your left eye. So what they would do with these split hemisphere patients is they would have like, first there would be like an eye tracker so that they could adjust what they're displaying on this screen exactly to wherever the person's looking, okay? Which is important because they would show stuff only to the right or the left eye. And they would make sure that that happens by always adjusting with an eye tracker for where, how they would display this, right? So, you know, details of the setup aside, they would show all sorts of different inputs to the left and right visual fields, but then they would also have them do tasks with like their left or right hands, possibly discordantly. So they would maybe ask to like, you know, they would show something to, this is assuming that the person is right hand dominant. They would show something to the right eye but they would see whether or not that information would be consistent with like an action by the person's right hand. Because if you show it to the right eye, supposedly that information is in the left hemisphere and only available to the left hand, right? But then you're asking for output actions of the right hand and supposedly then the left visual field didn't see it. Anyways, so they show all this stuff. And this is to say that they found out after, you know, looking at all these different conditions and, you know, you, you can read all these papers if you want to know the details because I'm doing a horrible job explaining it right now. But they localized then this part of the brain in the left hemisphere that they call the interpreter, which is sort of like synthesizing all of these inputs together, which then includes, because keep in mind, right, you have like, the lingual part of your brain is the left hemisphere. So a lot of the time they would do these split brain uh, perceptual experiments and you would show something to the left visual field and so the information is in the right hemisphere, which is, there are like verbal capabilities in the right hemisphere as we now come to know. It's not all in the left hemisphere, but like the dominant language ability is in the left hemisphere still. So like people, they call it like the uh, origins of, you could say yapping now or confabulation. It's just like people coming up with a narrative for why they did something or made some decision. And it has like totally no bearing on what really went down. So like they would show like literally like a banana to one visual field side and they would like have different choices for things and one of the choices would be banana and they would be like oh well why did you choose banana and the person would just like be coming up with this wild narrative explanation that has nothing to do with oh i i literally two seconds ago you guys flashed me an image of a banana right anyways but the function of this interpreter area of the left in the left hemisphere is for things like this is like you can do this right now. You go and touch your nose. And in that touching your own nose, would you say that you felt the in your hand and then in your nose the sensation of touching your nose that it was all at once? I would say yes. When I touch my nose, 
and I feel for, in my hand touching my nose and then in my nose, my hand, that occurs at the same time. But if you really think about it, your arm is however many feet, if you're not a midget, from the tip of your finger going to your brain and then the analogous nerves in the tip of your nose are only so many inches long, right? And so kind of just from like a physics of neurotransmitters point of view, the signal of touch from your nose to your brain is not as long as the signal time it takes to go all the way from your the end of your hand down your arm up into your brain right but everybody who's watching this probably if you're touching your nose right now it's all happening all at once so that is the interpreter and i'm pretty sure that that's also involved if like say i ask you you know uh questions from jonathan height's work about like morality let's say so it's like if, uh, you know, let's say that you can see your neighbor showering or something like that and you think that it's really hot sexually and but the neighbor doesn't know, is that morally okay? Well, from Jonathan Haidt's work, we find that most people, they have this like what we would call intuitive, instinctive gut feeling reaction to the question of whether or not that's okay. But then if now you ask someone, okay, now write a paragraph explaining why you think that that's right or wrong, that then when you're sitting to write that explanation, that is the interpreter doing the work. But that's not actually having localized what happened when you were necessarily making that moral decision, right? And that the contents of what you answer isn't necessarily like uh, the highest fidelity measurement of like what actually was involved in coming up with that decision. And then that's of course like, anyways, but then what I was going for in all this is Michael Gazaniga's work uh, talking about this thing called the interpreter, you know, that he finds in his split brain patient work. And what I just said about compilers, don't you think that's ironic, right? Because in computer science, making programs with compilers is opposed to doing it with like interpreters, right? Like if you're a language like Python, right? I'm pretty sure. And then to find that that one area of the brain is called an interpreter, I thought that that was funny. But, all right, so here, here we are back again this is a Vanderhagen the Stampede comment because this is what I was really wanting to talk about. Ed Witten's insights on the inverse square law of gravitation come to mind when I think about the evolution of our understanding of calculus and differential geometry. In a video I stumbled upon, Witten explains how Einstein's work finally shed light on the underlying reason behind this fundamental concept. Specifically, he highlights why it's an inverse square law rather than some other arbitrary pattern. This case also illustrates the evolution of mathematics and physics over time. Prior to Einstein, Newton's law can be seen as an approximation or limiting case of a more comprehensive theory. This perspective suggests that there could have been multiple solutions to the problem and that the inverse square law was just one possible outcome among many. However, Einstein's groundbreaking work reveals that the geometry of space-time around a massive object is actually what gives rise to the inverse square law. The boundary of space-time takes on a spheroidal shape, which means that its surface area increases quadratically with radius. This fundamental property of space-time's curvature makes the inverse square pattern a necessary consequence rather than just an empirical observation as it was in Newton's law. And then we have the link to the Ed Witten video where the guy interviewing him took the assignment way too seriously and it's, it's one thing to like wear a costume of someone, but to actually change your appearance, your hair, facial hairstyle, in order to look the part is a whole other thing. And that guy looking like Albert Einstein just, I think, took it way too far. But 
it was a good video nonetheless because yeah so i agree and i think i talked about this before where newton's classical mechanics you could say is a limiting case of einstein's general relativity so it's almost like uh you know right like an extra support for the correctness of general relativity that not only do you explain things that were hitherto unexplained but you also get everything else that you thought was correct about physics kind of like dropping out from that and it's another thing that makes it hard then moving forward when people are like well what we want something alternative to ed witten we want we don't want ed witten and string theory anymore that's part of the difficulty is that it's like at a higher level of abstraction a higher level of philosophical uh reasoning or contention so to speak when you have general relativity implies then the classical newton's inverse square law it's like whatever you're going to do alternatively to that has to address that level of abstraction it's not just enough to just write down equations that fit the data or have like god forbid some ml ai you know model fitting all the, you know your descriptive model of how it all works no thank you that's not what we're looking for here but it also brings up you know i wish that's it's like that's one of the things that i'm trying to learn differential geometry for in the first place is to get through wald's general relativity and to be like okay i've done my due diligence on the math side i'm not just gonna you know read general relativity wald's book and then learn the math that i need as i go no i'm gonna you know do it the right way it's like i'm gonna read the book before i watch the movie right then after doing that i want to read ed witten's lights rays singularities and all that 100 pages or whatever and then watch his high energy physics courses because that's really what you have to do as far as your due diligence if you want to say like oh you know ed witten is just he's betraying physicists by only focusing on the math or whatever it's like well if you don't actually get on his level or whatever then like what are you even saying right but uh, oh another thing that i like though is so like with the, the title of that video why the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics so then uh the try hard albert einstein lookalike asked him about that and witten basically said that it, he used a different word he said uncanny which then the word uncanny started bringing up a lot of freudian ideas for me i mean some people would say that a good intro read for freud is freud's work called uncanny and it kind of leans into also you could take it in this like lacanian route um but it's uh like for example ed witten in this video also brings up not theory and he's you know they're sort of talking about how wow isn't that so cool that not theory is applicable to theoretical physics that's kind of like the uncanny aspect or the quote-unquote unreasonable aspect of the effectiveness of mathematics in physics but i think it's summed up best when i think witten then says it's as if the creator of the universe is a mathematician because in spite of the system of mathematics the endeavor of the human project of mathematics is sort of predicated on this uh definitive deterministic repeatability that is you know in all points in space and time valid but this reminds me of an anonymous quote that i remember which is when you want something really really good to happen people say oh that's not realistic but then when something is going really bad or when something catastrophic happens people say 
that's real life. And I think though that sort of gets to the essence of what Ed Witten and Try Hard Look Alike Albert Einstein were talking about, which is the paradoxical nature of how you take something like not theory, which is almost like the furthest refinement of the greatest exertion of logical thought into understanding how you could literally tie a knot and how something like that, so rigorous and formal in that way, then is applied in theoretical physics where you're understanding these things like how black holes or all these things work, right? To have expected not theory to have an application in that area seems to not make sense. And I think when Ed Witten used the term uncanny, that that's a more illustrative term than to say the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics, because it's, again, getting at that paradoxical aspect of, when I say Lacanian, it's like you go through your everyday life, it's this symbolic interaction, right? When you go to the grocery store, you check out in line and you say, lady, oh, how are you? Oh, I'm having a good day. Do you, did you find everything okay? Yeah, oh yes, I did. Do you have your bags? It's a very uh, canned interaction, right? You're not asking the lady, oh my gosh, you know them personally, oh, your name, how's your mother doing and all these sorts of things. But then if, let's say at the supermarket, someone were to run in brandishing a pistol and you suddenly see the grocery store clerk who got shot laying there dying or whatever, the way that you act in that moment is not planned at all. And nonetheless, between you going through the checkout line normally or in the hypothetical uh, grocery store shooting example, you are still ostensibly the same individual. Those are the kinds of like, you know, you're confronting the capital R real when there's like, you know, someone bursts into a grocery store shooting it up, right? Versus like the mundane, banal, everyday, uh, symbolic reality where you're in this detached, post-industrial, alienated, you don't know everyone state, right? Anyways. So yeah, very inspiring comments and uh, just as a reminder, <laughs> Yeah, comment down below and your comment could be a future viewer comment of the week. So finally, we're going to open up Differential Geometry by Erwin Kreisig. For once, <sighs> section 62, conformal mapping of surfaces into a plane. We consider an allowable mapping capital T of a portion capital S of a surface into a plane capital E and denote by U1 and U2 Cartesian coordinates in the plane E. We may introduce U1 and U2 as coordinates on the portion of the surface S. If in particular the mapping T is a conformal mapping, then the first fundamental form on the portion of a surface S with respect to the Cartesian coordinates U1 and U2 is given by the expression ds squared is equal to nu in terms of U1 and U2, then times du1 squared plus du2 squared, where nu is positive. And this follows immediately from theorem 61.1, which in the previous section was given as an allowable mapping of a portion s of a surface onto a portion s star of a surface is conformal if and only if when on s and s star the same coordinate systems have been introduced, the coefficients g sub alpha beta and g star sub alpha beta of the first fundamental forms of s and s star respectively are proportional. Also, I will say, if we go back to the notation on the very first and second pages of the very first chapter on preliminaries, we look at how it's building up here. Okay, coordinates, arc length, tangent, principal normal, binormal, curvature, torsion, coordinates on a surface. Turning the page, we have the Einstein summation convention. So remembering all this stuff having to do with tensors, 
first fundamental form, discriminant of the first fundamental form. We keep going normal curvature, Gaussian curvature, principal curvatures, mean curvature, Christoffel symbols, geodesic curvature, and then the third fundamental form. So if we remember, third fundamental form, that was section 59. So that was like two videos ago now, three videos ago. And we had to remind ourselves the Gaussian curvature times the first fundamental form minus two times the mean curvature times the second fundamental form plus the third fundamental form all equals zero. So we had just got to that a few sections ago and that was all of the notation, right? Was getting to the very last one was third fundamental form. So now we can appreciate it's like we've built up in the previous 200 pages up to third fundamental forms and now finally having all of the notation and sort of like machinery that we're gonna to need to get to the real, we're getting to the real nitty gritty now. And yeah, it's, it's almost like the book is just getting started now with we're gonna do conformal mappings in differential geometry, let's go, okay. Definition 62.1. Allowable coordinates U1 and U2 on a surface S for which the corresponding first fundamental form is of the type given by the expression above for ds squared. These are called isothermic coordinates on that surface S. As was seen in section 59 that I just talked about on the third fundamental form, the set of all surfaces which can be mapped isometrically into a plane is relatively small. The requirement of conformality is much less restrictive than isometry. We may consequently expect that the set of surfaces which can be mapped conformally into a plane will be much larger than the above set. Okay, and I guess it's probably good to remind ourselves now. In isometric mapping from section 57, so conformal is angle preserving, but isometric is length preserving in general terms. But specifically, an allowable mapping of a portion capital S of a surface onto a portion capital S star of a surface is isometric if and only if at corresponding points of S and S star when referred to the same coordinate systems on S and S star, the coefficients of the first fundamental forms on S and S star are the same, namely G sub alpha beta equals G star sub alpha beta for the various values of alpha and beta being either one or two. So when we had equality exactly in isometry for conformal, or sorry, for, yeah, in the case of a conformal mapping, you only have to be proportional in terms of some function defined upon the coordinates of your surface of interest. Anyways, let each of two surfaces S1 and S2 be mapped conformally onto a surface S3. If we associate each point of S1 with that point of S2, which has the same image point in S3, we obtain a conformal mapping of S1 onto S2. Let us assume that S1 can be mapped conformally into a plane, say, E1, and that S2 can be mapped conformally into a plane, say, E2. Then if E1 is mapped conformally onto E2 in a general way, by composing the mappings, we obtain the most general conformal mapping of S1 onto S2. Interesting. Let U1, U2, and U1 star, U2 star be Cartesian coordinates in the planes E1 and E2, respectively. If the function h of u, where u is equal to u1 plus i u2, is a function regular in a domain capital D1 of the E1 plane, and if capital D2 denotes the range of values of the function h in the E2 plane, then w is equivalent to u1 star plus i u2 star, which is equal to h of u, and u is equal to u1 plus i times u2, and i is equal to, of course, the square root of negative one, and dh du is non-zero. So with this being said, h of u is a conformal mapping of d1 onto d2, and this is a well-known result of the theory of analytic functions of a complex variable. So we're still really doing complex analysis here. H of U satisfies the Cauchy-Riemann differential equations. 
partial u1 star, partial u1 is equal to partial u2 star, partial u2, and partial u1 star, partial u2 is equal to negative partial u2 star, partial u1. By differentiating these equations and equating the mixed second partial derivatives, we obtain the integrability conditions delta ua star is equivalent to partial squared u alpha star partial u1 squared plus partial squared u alpha star partial u2 squared is equal to zero for alpha equal to one or two. The problem of determining a conformal mapping of a portion of a surface into a plane will lead to a more general form of the equation of Laplace. In order to solve this problem, we have to prove that isothermic coordinates can be introduced on that portion. If we take these coordinates as Cartesian coordinates in the image plane, we obtain the desired conformal mapping. Theorem 62.1. Any simply connected portion S of a surface which has a representation of class R greater than or equal to 3, that is to say it's at least 3 times differentiable, and on that third derivative, there's at least one derivative that does not go away to zero, then that simply connected portion can be conformally mapped into a plane. And for the first time in this book, we have a sketch of a proof. We don't have an actual proof. So that's probably an indication that if we do a little bit of internet searching, we can find a brutal, full, fleshed out illustration of a proof. Not just a wimpy sketch here, but I have a feeling this is still gonna be quite the mouthful here. Sketch of proof. It is sufficient to prove that the simply connected portion S admits isothermic coordinates U1 and U2. Then by introducing these coordinates as Cartesian coordinates in the image plane, we obtain the desired mapping. Let U1 tilde and U2 tilde be the originally given allowable coordinates on S. We will prove the existence of an allowable transformation for which we can refer back to section 24 for a definition of an allowable transformation. So if we have a transformation with a parametric representation in terms of a few given coordinates, say, then that transformation is allowable if the functions in terms of those coordinates for the parametric representation of the transformation are defined in a domain capital B over bar such that the corresponding range of values includes the domain capital B. And then that these functions are of a class R greater than or equal to one. So that's to say they're at least one times differentiable and that in one of these coordinate directions, the derivative is non-zero. So they're of class R greater than or equal to one everywhere in capital B over bar. And these functions and this transformation is a one-to-one -one transformation. And the third assumption is that the Jacobian of this transformation is different from zero everywhere in the domain, capital B over bar, say, of that particular transformation, which in this case is a simply connected portion of a surface. So we will prove the existence of an allowable transformation, u alpha equal to a function u alpha in terms of u1 tilde and u2 tilde, where alpha can be one or two, by which the isothermic coordinates u1 and u2 are represented as functions of the originally given ones. If this parametric representation of the transformation is allowable, its inverse exists as per section 24. With respect to the isothermic coordinates, according to the definition of isothermic coordinates, we must have g sub alpha beta is equal to nu times delta sub alpha beta and g equals nu squared. So capital nu for the proportionality between the first fundamental form on the different portions of the surface. Consequently, the parametric representation of this transformation must be of such a type that we have capital nu times delta sub mu lowercase mu equals g tilde sub alpha beta times partial u tilde alpha partial u mu then times partial u tilde beta partial u lowercase nu and delta superscript mu lowercase nu all over capital mu equals 
g tilde superscript alpha beta then times partial u mu partial u tilde alpha then times partial u lowercase nu partial u tilde beta where capital nu again for the proportionality between g sub alpha beta and delta sub alpha beta is positive. Setting mu equal to 1 and lowercase nu equal to 2, we find from this g tilde superscript alpha beta times partial u1 partial u tilde alpha then times partial u2 partial u tilde beta is equal to 0. Setting mu equal to lowercase nu equal to 1 and mu equal to lowercase nu equal to 2 respectively and eliminating capital nu, we have that g tilde superscript alpha beta times partial u1 partial u tilde alpha then times partial u1 partial u tilde beta is equal to g tilde superscript sigma tau then times partial u2 partial u tilde sigma then times partial u2 partial u tilde tau. If the functions for the parametric representation of the transformation of interest here to be obtained satisfy the relations partial u1 partial u tilde alpha equals g tilde sub alpha kappa then times epsilon tilde superscript kappa lambda times partial u2 partial u tilde lambda where alpha can be one or two for which referred to section 33 which actually is the first section that I read from the book after my beginning rant in my length, angles, and area differential geometry reading stream video. They also satisfy, they also satisfy these relations which we just came up with for first fundamental forms g tilde superscript alpha beta and g tilde superscript sigma tau as can be seen by inserting and by using the answer to problem 33.2 which is to find a representation of the contravariant metric tensor in terms of the covariant one and epsilon tensors. Uh oh, he getting mad, he getting grumpy. Why don't you just sit and read a differential geometry book with me, little boy? Which may also be written in the form the square root of g tilde, then times epsilon tilde superscript alpha beta, then times partial square root u1, partial u tilde alpha, partial u tilde beta equals zero. Since the square root of g tilde then times e tilde superscript alpha beta is constant, zero or positive or negative one, by the relation which is equating partial u1, partial u tilde alpha, and partial u2, partial u tilde lambda by the proportionality factor g tilde sub alpha kappa then times epsilon tilde superscript kappa lambda, we obtain from the preceding relation the square root of g tilde then times epsilon tilde superscript alpha beta then times partial with respect to u tilde beta of g tilde sub alpha kappa then times epsilon tilde superscript kappa lambda then times partial u2 partial u tilde lambda close quantity is equal to partial with respect to u tilde beta of the quantity the square root of g tilde then times g tilde sub alpha kappa then times epsilon tilde superscript alpha beta, then times epsilon tilde superscript kappa lambda, then times partial u2 partial u tilde lambda close quantity, which is then equal to the partial with respect to u tilde beta of the quantity, the square root of g tilde, then times g tilde superscript beta lambda, then times partial u2 partial u tilde lambda close quantity equals zero, where the last expression is a consequence of the representation of the contravariant metric tensor given in problem 33.2. The above equation is a linear partial differential equation with coefficients of at least class one. In every sufficiently small domain, capital S1 of capital S, there exist solutions of that equation which are not constant as can be proved by successive approximation, for which we can refer to this guy A. Korn's book. It's not funny to make fun of people like that. The same thus holds for the above relation 62.5. A similar differential equation can be obtained from 62.5 by solving for partial u2, partial u tilde lambda. For this purpose, we have to take the inner product of that 62.5 relation and g tilde sub beta sigma then times epsilon tilde superscript alpha beta. The right hand side of that relation 62.5 then takes the form g tilde sub alpha kappa then times g tilde sub beta sigma then times epsilon tilde superscript alpha beta then times epsilon tilde superscript kappa lambda equals epsilon tilde sub kappa sigma, that's funny kappa sigma, 
Kappa Sigma. Okay, here we go. Epsilon to the superscript Kappa Lambda equals delta sub sigma, then superscript lambda. Since epsilon tilde superscript alpha beta equals negative epsilon tilde superscript beta alpha, some nice commutativity there, we thus obtain partial u2 partial u tilde sigma is equivalent to negative g tilde sub beta sigma, then times epsilon tilde superscript beta alpha, then times partial u1 partial u tilde alpha, where sigma can be one or two. So the equation 62.5 and the one above, which is 62.7, are generalizations of the Cauchy-Riemann differential equations. From the relation at the very beginning of this section, ds squared equals capital nu in terms of u1 and u2, then times quantity du1 squared plus du2 squared closed quantity, we obtain that capital nu squared is equal to g, the discriminant of the first fundamental form, which is equal to g tilde, of partial in terms of u tilde 1 and u tilde 2, partial in terms of u1 and u2, all squared, for which refer back to 28.4, which is from theorem 28.3. If the coordinates u1 and u2 undergo an allowable transformation, u alpha with a parametric representation function u alpha in terms of u over bar 1 and u over bar 2, where alpha can be 1 or 2, then g over bar is equal to capital D squared then times g, and g is equal to capital D over bar squared then times g over bar, where g over bar is the discriminant of the first fundamental form with respect to the coordinates u over bar one and u over bar two, and d and d over bar are the Jacobians of the coordinate transformation and of its inverse. We will now prove that the Jacobian of the transformation, u alpha given by a parametric representation function u alpha in terms of u tilde one and u tilde two is different from zero. So from the relation 62.5, we find partial u one u two partial u tilde one u tilde two is equal to g tilde sub one kappa, then times epsilon tilde superscript kappa lambda, then times partial u2, partial u tilde lambda, then times partial u2, partial u tilde 2, then minus g tilde subscript 2 kappa, then times epsilon tilde superscript kappa lambda, then times partial u2, partial u tilde lambda, then times partial u2, partial u tilde 1. Or partial u1, u2, partial u tilde 1, u tilde 2 is equal to 1 over the square root of g tilde, then times the quantity g tilde sub 2, 2, then times partial u2, partial u tilde 1 squared, then minus 2 times g tilde sub 1, 2, then times partial u2, partial u tilde 1, then times partial u2, partial u tilde 2, then plus g tilde sub 1, 1, then times the quantity partial u2, partial u tilde 2, close quantity squared, close outer quantity. This quadratic form is positive definite. Consequently, it vanishes only if both of the partial derivatives, partial u2, partial u tilde alpha, where alpha is one or two, are zero. But this cannot be true for a regular solution of the relation in 62.6. We may thus introduce isothermic coordinates in the domain S1 of S and obtain a conformal mapping of S1 into the plane. Local conformal mappings of other sufficiently small parts of S can be similarly obtained. A conformal mapping of S into the plane must be finally composed of all these different local mappings. The situation is as follows. Consider two parts of S, say S1 and S2, which have a non-empty intersection D, and which are mapped into the plane by two different local conformal mappings. D has two different images which are connected by a one-to-one -one conformal mapping T, for which refer to figure 74 at left. The composition of the two local mappings consists in mapping the images of S1 and S2 onto a circular disk in such a manner that corresponding points of both images of D always coincide. The solution of this composition problem may be obtained by means of function theory. In this manner, we gain, stepwise, a uniform conformal mapping of S into the plane. If the above procedure has led to infinitely many local mappings, then difficulties arise which can be overcome by the theory of uniformization. Yeah, so breaking out the function theory, and we're looking at partial differential equations. And so, I mean, we can see below, we've got another reference to Louisville, who, sure, last video we saw how 
Louisville's theorem limited the possibility of the confines of conformal mappings that you can have in higher dimensions. But where I had originally heard Louisville from was from Sturm Louisville equations. Uh, and so, yeah, looking below, we have sure isotropic curves and isothermic coordinates, but then section 64 after that, uh, just scanning the first couple paragraphs here, we're talking about function theory again. And so, yeah, we're, we're kind of like how I mentioned when we uh, glanced back at the notation. I'm like, wow, the, no the new notation ended really at the third fundamental form. And now we're finally getting into it. It's like we're starting to appreciate why that is. Anyways, function theory is no joke. Moving on. Problem 62.1. A surface S is called a surface of Louisville if isothermic coordinates on S can be introduced so that the corresponding first fundamental form is of the type ds squared is equal to the quantity capital A plus capital B close quantity then times quantity du1 squared plus du2 squared close quantity where A depends on u1 only while B depends on u2 only. Prove that in the case of such a surface the differential equation of the geodesics can be completely integrated. Like I said, we're not reading from a joke book today. The solution to problem 62.1. The coordinates are orthogonal. We have that g sub 1, 1 equals g sub 2, 2 equals the square root of g, which equals a plus b. And from 47.8 prime, 2 times the square root of g, then times Christoffel sub 1, 2 superscript 2 equals 2 times the square root of g times Christoffel sub 1 superscript 1 equals negative 2, then times the square root of g, then times Christoffel sub 2, 2 superscript 1, which equals a prime, and negative 2 times the square root of g times Christoffel sub 1, 1 superscript 2 equals 2 times the square root of g, then times Christoffel sub 1, 2 superscript 1 equals 2 times the square root of g times Christoffel sub 2, 2 superscript 2 equals b prime where a prime denotes the derivative with respect to that variable on which the corresponding function depends. From 49.7, we thus find 1 half times the quantity u1 dot squared plus u2 dot squared close quantity, then times the quantity a prime times u2 dot minus b prime times u1 dot close quantity plus the quantity a plus b close quantity, then times the quantity u1 dot, then times u2 double dot, then minus u1 double dot times u2 dot, close quantity, equals zero. This is equivalent to DDS of the quantity a times u2 dot squared minus b times u1 dot squared, all over a denominator of u1 dot squared plus u2 dot squared, close quantity, all equal to zero. If we integrate, we obtain fraction with a numerator of a times u2 dot squared minus b times u1 dot squared all over a denominator of u1 dot squared plus u2 dot squared all equal to c or u1 dot squared all over a minus c is equal to u2 dot squared all over b plus c where c is a constant of integration Integrating once more, we have that the integral of du1 over the square root of the quantity a minus c, then minus the integral of du2 over the square root of the quantity b plus c, close quantity, is equal to c star. Yeah, these have been some heavy-winded but short sections recently. And I feel like I'm still kind of getting back into the swing of it after a few months there at the end of summer, taking a little bit of a break from the differential geometry reading streams. But I hope you guys enjoyed this one and hope you guys like the outfit. We're going with the blue pinstripe on the white with blue pinstripes. So Stripes on stripes with the burgundy foulard tie. This one's a little bit wider than 
normal. And yeah, the gold tank Peugeot watch, gold signet ring. I'd wear this with just some classic Capto Oxfords. And like I said, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Hope you learned something. I hope it's put you to sleep if that was your goal. Hope you got a lot of work done if this was in the background. And see you guys in the next one. Peace.